Hey guys, TomBoss21 here, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you the foundations of exploitative poker. We'll start with a GTO versus exploit comparison, then I'm going to teach you the five fundamental imbalances and how to exploit each one of them. We'll back each one of these up with practical examples from GTO Wizard's node locking tool. Hey everyone, before we start the video, we'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like and subscribe buttons. Your support means a lot to us. Let's talk about balanced versus exploitative poker. A balanced style of poker is a defensive strategy. It seeks to minimize your own leaks and it doesn't adapt to the opposition. This style, when implemented correctly, carries no risk of counter exploitation and is the strongest fixed strategy you can play. It doesn't require any reads. However, the downside is it doesn't necessarily maximize win rate because it doesn't seek to take advantage of your opponent's mistakes. That's where exploitative poker comes in. Now, an exploitative style is offensive. It seeks to attack your opponent's leaks and it adapts the different types of opponents. However, any exploit carries some risk of counter exploitation. And to do this properly, you require reads. So you need to have some insights into your opponent's strategy. This style, when done correctly, can maximize your win rate. Many players will argue that you're either one or the other. You're either a GTO player or you're an exploitative player. But this couldn't be further from the truth. The best players in the world use a hybrid approach, and furthermore, you can't understand one style without understanding the other. For example, GTO is informed by the potential exploits of the position, whereas exploitative poker uses GTO as a baseline. If you're looking at some solver output, some sim, how are you going to understand why it is the way it is without also understanding that the opponent could exploit them in this or that way if they didn't use this strategy? And conversely, how are you going to play exploitative poker if you don't know how to use GTO as a baseline? How can you say that they're bluffing too much if you don't know what the right amount of bluffiness is in the first place, right? You need one for the other. In fact, this is actually how solvers work. To generate a Nash equilibrium solution, you take two exploitative bots, have them play each other until neither can exploit further, and that's equilibrium, that's GTO. There are two categories of exploits, proactive and reactive. A proactive exploit involves adjusting your strategy before they've deviated, so anticipating their mistake. Whereas a reactive exploit involves adjusting your strategy after they've made their move. If you watched our previous video, Don Corleone calls this the setup and punish. Before you can start implementing these tactical exploits, you first need to learn to recognize imbalances. An imbalance is a way some strategy can be different from GTO. The problem is there's an infinite number of strategies, so we need to break this down into different categories. I call these the five fundamental imbalances. The first one is betting volume, which asks what lines they're putting in the most money. Do they put a lot of money into the betting line or the checking line, for example? The next is equity management, which asks how they appraise their hand classes and how they allocate their value and nutted hands. Are they putting lots of nuts into this line but not that line? Well, that's a useful piece of information. The next is polarity, or more generally, range morphology. So this asks, is their range representing nuts and bluffs, or is their range more middling strength hands? Then we have elasticity, which asks how sensitive their response is to pricing. Will they react the same way to a small bet as they would a medium bet? Well, that's another crucial piece of information. Finally, there's board coverage. Board coverage generally asks how well they can represent hand classes on different types of runouts. And... In particular, we're interested in knowing if certain lines are over or undersaturated with certain hand classes. These imbalances create incentives for you to take on some risk in order to capitalize on your opponent's mistakes. And exploitative poker is all about studying incentives. In the following examples, I want you to keep in mind that I'm not prescribing a strategy. I'm not saying you ought to be playing this or that way. I'm merely demonstrating how these imbalances incentivize your exploits. Something else to keep in mind, and we'll see this in some following examples, is that solvers will actively try to thwart your node locks. You must keep in mind when studying with solvers that they are just EV maximizing algorithms. So if you force one player to play a hugely minus EV strategy, it probably tries to redirect those hands into other lines in order to minimize the damage. I'm going to show you a few tips and tricks for studying with node locks and how we can prevent it from ruining our experiments. In this video, we'll break down the five fundamental imbalances and we'll show you how to attack them using GTO wizard node locking. Let's start with betting volume. Recall, betting volume asks what lines your opponent is putting in the most money. That's where you'll want to put your value hands. They could be putting in money through bets or raises or through calls. Now, imagine that your opponent bets a lot when you check to them. That's going to give you an incentive to put your nutted hands into the checking line because that's how they'll make more money. Conversely, imagine your opponent raises a lot when you bet. That's going to give you incentive to put your nutted hands into the betting line because they'll expect to face more raises 
and therefore make more money. So it all comes down to the idea of just imagine you had the nuts. What line makes the most money? Generally speaking, your nutted hands dictate your strategy and the rest of your hands follow along. So let me dive into an example. For my first example, I've chosen a blind versus blind single raise pot. Ranges are taken from a cash game. However, these fundamental exploits will apply to all formats. Let's run an experiment. Here we can see the original strategies. When we check, a big blind is supposed to check back often, but sometimes they hit us with this really big pot size bet. I want to make them more aggressive when we check. So instead of 26% of the time, we're going to make them bet 40% of the time. We'll lock, solve, and here we can see now they're being more aggressive. How should small blind adapt knowing that big blind is too aggressive in the checking line? So how should we react or proactively adjust small blinds range? Well, <laughs> unsurprisingly, it is now checking 100% of hands. And the reason for this is quite simple. If we go back to the GTO solution for a second here, take a look at the expected value of something nutted. For example, uh, let's take a look at tens. You'll notice that the EV of betting and checking is quite similar. In fact, it's almost equal. And this will be the case for the vast majority of nutted hands in our range. If we compare the expected value between betting and checking, we can see that most of these hands are in white. Okay. But this is predicated on a certain assumption. This is predicated on the assumption that your hands are going to see the same amount of money going to the pot in both the checking and the betting lines. So we expect that tens will make the same amount of money in both lines. However, when we made big blind more aggressive, we increased the amount of money that went into the pot in the checking line. And therefore, all of your nutted hands have now have more incentive to go into this line. And because all our nutted hands want to go into the checking line, the rest of the hands followed along because, well, the solver doesn't want to put a bunch of mediocre hands into one line and all the nuts into another because that's too exploitable. Going back to the node lock here, we can see that if we change this to compare EV and we compare, for example, the expected value of checking against betting and just filter for the top of our range, we'll see that all of a sudden our value hands are lit up in green, indicating that checking is now higher EV than betting. Let's try another experiment. Let's imagine that big blind is raising too often against our lead. So they're supposed to raise 13% of the time. We'll put that up to 20% and lock that in place. How should small blind adjust? Well, logically we'd think that they should be betting more with their value hands, right? Because they'll make more money that way. Let's take a look. If we compare this to the GTO strategy, we'll see that we're actually checking a lot more overall. You can see that GTO was actually more aggressive than our node lock strategy. What's going on here? And similarly, even our value hands are checking more often. And this is an important lesson when it comes to working with solvers. You see, solvers are EV maximizing algorithms and they're gonna do everything they can to minimize the damage for whatever crazy strategy you force them to take. So what's happening here is that when we check, Big Blind has actually increased their betting volume in this line in order to balance it out. So we firstly increased the expected value of the betting line. So we increased how much money is going in here. And then to compensate, Big Blind is now increasing the betting volume in the checking line. If we compare to the GTL solution, we can see that Big Blind is now more aggressive than they were before putting in quite a bit more betting volume now. And they've done this to compensate for the fact that the 25% line is now a line where they have to put in too much money. So they're trying to balance it in both cases. Okay, so let's repeat this experiment one last time. And this time we're going to force Big Blind to check a GTO range. Okay, so it's the exact same setup, but this time I forced them to behave the exact same way as GTO in the checking line. So they can't balance out their betting volume. And I've still forced them to raise more often in the betting line. Going back here, we can see that small blind strategy has adjusted and in particular, it's become a lot more linear. You can see with over pairs plus, we are very rarely slow playing. Compare that to the GTO solution. Here we can see we're betting less often, but hands like straights, sets, two pair, over pair, top pair, all of these hands are betting more often in the node locked solution because they expect to make more money in that line. 
And so this is the key concept of betting volume. Your nutted hands will want to follow the line that makes the most money, obviously, right? And the rest of your hands tend to follow along. Well, there are some complications. For example, this we saw earlier with the silver adjusting its strategy and trying to balance its betting volume. Overall, the heuristic will always apply. It should be noted that betting volume is not restricted to one street. In reality, opponents might be putting in more volume on later streets, and that can change the equation. But you need to understand this fundamental thing in order to begin your exploits. The next fundamental imbalance comes down to how they manage their equity. There are two parts to this. There's nut allocation, which asks where are they putting their strongest hands? Are they putting a lot of value into this line or that line? And then hand appraisal. So how much do they value different types of hand classes? How much money are they willing to put in with this type of hand or that type of hand? So let me show you some examples of how you can use this concept to exploit in poker. For this next example, I've chosen a button versus big blind single raise pot. Flop is a6-3, we bet small, get called, turn is the six of spades, pairing the middle card. So surprisingly, Button prefers this massive 200% overbet here with like a thin part of its range. You can see with this overbet, they're representing things like boats, trips, very strong top pair, and about 56% of the range are bluffs. Okay, so here's a question for you. Do you believe that your opponents, when they overbet twice the pot, are bluffing more than half the time? Maybe not. Okay, well, let's see what happens if that's the case. Let's node lock this. And I'm gonna start by locking everything in place. And I'm gonna adjust the strategy. So first of all, we're gonna make all of these nutted hands. So trips plus are all gonna pure bet. And let's go ahead and adjust the trash hands. So I'll use this little filter thing here. And we'll just make them check more of these bluffs. So now they're under bluffing and value betting too much. So we've created a value imbalance. Now the exploit against this is very, very obvious. Obviously we're gonna overfold because they're too value heavy. But how much are we gonna overfold? Well, we're gonna overfold a lot. So you can see we're folding 92% of our range. Let's compare that to the GTO strategy. Here we can see the original GTO strategy was calling about a third of the time. The new strategy is only calling about 7% of the time. So as you can see, the adjustment is pretty obvious. The main thing being that hands like top pair, under pairs, all of these marginal bluff catchers are no longer good calls because they're not going to be checking back the river often enough. Their, their range is too value heavy. So a lot of these mediocre bluff catchers that rely on your opponent betting turn giving up river, they're just no longer going to make enough money. That one's pretty obvious. Something else to keep in mind is that Button has checked or has capped their checking range. So their checking range no longer contains any of these strongest hands. And therefore, so just as an example, none of these hands are checking anymore, so they can't represent trips, full houses, quads on any river. So obviously you can attack them pretty aggressively on a lot of different rivers. Yeah, I'll just choose like a seven of clubs, for example. You can see an absurd like 1000% overbet, just 10x all in. And this is just coming from the fact that Button's range is going to be too capped in a lot of these lines. All right, so let's do the opposite test this time. Let's make them too bluff heavy. So I'm going to revert to the GTO strategy. And again, we'll start here. We're going to node lock this, except this time we're going to have them bluff more often with air. So again, we'll lock everything in place and we'll just have them bluff, let's say, some flush draws and just some random weak air. Okay, so now we've created a bluffing imbalance. They're bluffing too often, way too often. <laughs> so how do we handle a situation like this? Well, they put in a lot of money with a very polarized range. And as you can see, the silver just doesn't fold a lot, right? The problem is that button is simply representing too much air. So what's going to happen is the button's simply going to have to uh, just check back the river a ton. So for example, if I choose like a two of hearts here, we could probably bet pretty aggressively, but even if we check on some lines, uh, basically they're just going to have to check behind a lot of the time. As you can see, like it looks like a lot of red here, but keep in mind these offsuit combos count for a lot of weight. And so they just end up checking behind with complete garbage. You can see it's just pure air so often that basically anything with showdown value in our range is going to be a fine call even king high, which is absurd. I mean, maybe don't actually do that, but as you can see, the silver gets pretty out of line if you're too bluff heavy or too value heavy.
So this time, what I want to do is model a player who isn't going to be able to find the fold with hands like top pair or like a nut flush draw here. So put in this bet and we'll node lock them. And this time, instead of locking everything, uh, I'm just going to use what's called combo locking. So I'm only going to lock, for example, just this one hand class, top pair here, and the rest of their range can adjust. Let's see what happens. So we're modeling a player that overvalues top pair and is willing to call even like a 2x pot bet here. Let's compare what has happened. So first of all, we'll notice something interesting is that their actual, their calling volume hasn't changed at all. They're calling exactly the same frequency, although with different hands. And this is kind of odd, but if you take a look, what's happening is that they're compensating by folding more draws. They are now folding more often with flush draws, as you can see here, and that helps them compensate for the fact that they now have to call more often with their top pair. So let's go ahead and lock the flush draws in place as well. All of their flush draws must call. And again, what we can see here is that the calling frequency still hasn't changed, but something else has. So let me go back to hands and compare against the GTO solution. Okay, so the overall strategy hasn't really changed. Only calling like 1% more, it's not really a real difference here, right? So what's happening? How are we able to lock these calls in place and yet they are calling more often. Well, what's happened is another lesson in node locking. A solver will do whatever it can to minimize the damage of whatever absurd strategy you forced it to play. And in this case, it's found that donking is now a much better strategy because now it doesn't have to put its top pair into this really ugly line you forced it to play. So now we'll find that most of the flush draws as well as the top pair are now going into a donking line. We don't want that. <laughs> so what we'll do is again, just force them to check. This is what they were doing in equilibrium. They were just checking on the turn always. Again, we're gonna force them to check and now our experiment should work. A good tip to keep in mind is to always lock the root nodes. Otherwise the solver may proactively adjust in order to, to thwart whatever you're trying to do. Okay, here we put in this big size. Now we can see that they're calling, let's say 45% of the time. So now they are calling more often. Again, comparing this to GTO, we can see now their calling frequency has realistically increased quite a bit. So how should Button proactively adjust their range knowing Big Blind is kind of a station? Well, exploit should be obvious to most strong players. It's to bet more value heavy, bet a lot more linearly. So let's compare. Sizing hasn't changed. We're betting a little bit less often. You can see from 22 to 19. But what's mainly happened, we are now betting more often with our best hands. So you can see in the GTO solution, we are only betting 35% of the time with our best hands. And now we're betting 52% of the time. And the other thing is that we're bluffing less often. So you can see weak hands and trash, bluffing less often, bluffing less often. So it's, it's pretty straightforward if your opponent is calling too much. Your bluffs aren't going to make enough money, so you bluff less often. And your value hands are going to make more money, so you value bet more often, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. The next fundamental imbalance is polarity. Polarity asks about your opponent's range construction. Are they representing nuts and bluffs? Well, that's a very polarized range. Or are they representing a merged range with lots of medium strength hands and draws and such? Depending on how the range is constructed, you'll want to alter your strategy. How polarized is their range? On the one hand, consider the case where they are completely unpolarized, or also known as condensed. A condensed range is one that's representing medium strength hands without strong or weak hands. In this case, you are the polarized player with bluffs and nuts, and you want to be attacking that condensed range with big sizes. And the reason is that that's how you get the most money from the top of your range, and also put the most pressure on your opponent. So if your opponent can't represent or counter your aggression with nutted hands, well, you want to be betting big and playing for stacks. Now, conversely, you want to attack polarized ranges with small sizes. And the reason is that a polarized range struggles to call. So imagine that your opponent is representing lots of strong hands and lots of like really weak bluffs. They're going to have a very hard time facing a min click or a small bet. And the reason is that their value hands want to get more money in and their bluffs cannot afford to call. So their only choice is to overfold or put bluffs that will underrealize their equity into their calling line, or slow play value that doesn't want to slow play. Again, attack condensed ranges with big sizes, attack polar ranges with small sizes. Now a caveat to this is that if their range is perfectly polarized, you don't want to attack. So if they're only representing the stone cold nuts in a pure bluff, 
obviously you have no incentive to bet into that. However, in most cases, they'll, they're representing a range of value hands and a range of bluffs and some stuff in between. So most of the time, they're not perfectly polar and opportunities do arise where you want to actually attack these ranges. In some cases, if there's a value imbalance, you might even want to overfold drastically depending on how much nutted hands they're putting in there or overcall drastically. So there are concepts such as leverage and value imbalances. You can view our previous YouTube video on leverage. Leverage is this concept that polarized range can bet multiple streets and it realizes a lot more equity than you think it does. So for example, on the flop, if they have just nuts and bluffs, that player can bet like one third nuts, two third bluffs, and that's a perfectly balanced range because they have the ability to bet again on turn and river. So watch out for leverage because if your opponent is too polar, they might be putting you in a very bad reverse implied odds situation and you need to know how to get out of that. Value imbalances is another thing. So for example, say your opponent is betting huge on the river, but they've taken a line that represents almost exclusively like medium strength value. Uh, and their huge line stops making sense. In this case, they might be putting too many bluffs into that line but not enough nutted hands because it doesn't make sense for the type of value they're representing. We're going to go through some examples here of how you can respond to different levels of polarity and some common mistakes players make and how you can exploit that. So this next example should be pretty obvious to most players, but it concerns attacking condensed ranges. Here we have an under the gun versus big blind single raise pot. It is 10, 9, 6, 2 tone. And under the gun is supposed to check back a decent number of, for example, over pairs, top pairs, uh, second pairs. So there's a lot of hands here that should check back despite this being kind of a scary board, right? So let's node lock this. And I'm gonna go ahead and set the strategy. We'll make it so that all of their top pair plus must bet. So what we're gonna do here essentially is cap their checking range. Now I've left the other hands open so they can adjust the amount of bluffs in the betting range to make it somewhat balanced, but they're not gonna be able to check back with a hand like top pair or better. I think a lot of players wouldn't here. They would be just bet all of these hands, right? So what happens when they now check? Well, their checking range is very condensed, right? Second pair, third pair, low pairs, lots of pairs and ace high. And they've had to bet quite a bit wider now too to compensate for the fact that they put all their value into their betting line. Unfortunately for them, what this means is that when they check and take some bricks, or, well, I guess queen isn't really a brick, but on most turn cards, under the gun is going to struggle in their check back line. And the reason is that they've capped their checking range, right? And so now we can attack this quite aggressively, 42% of the time, if we compare that to the GTO solution. Here you can see that originally we were betting like only 8.5% of our range, and now we're betting 44% of the time. And if we choose like a different turn card, for example, let's say like a two of clubs or something, we're going to see that it's able to bet very aggressively because this doesn't trump the top pair. Yeah, so now 280% with two thirds of our range. So very, very aggressively attacking under the gun here. Uh, we, we could even say that the queen was actually kind of a godsend for under the gun because it devalued big blind's top pair. But here, top pair is effectively the nuts, right? So 10x is ahead of basically 100% of under the gun's range because UTG didn't trap enough. And so Big blind can now attack super aggressively and put them in a really bad spot. This is the basic concept. If your opponent is capping their range, they're too condensed, you generally want to attack with really big sizes and aggressive strategies. All right, let me show you how to attack ranges that are too polarized. So this is a button versus big blind single race pot, and Jack-Jack-5 is a beautiful board for the button because they can range bet super wide, and they do so here action on big blind and big blind is supposed to counter this with a very aggressive check raising strategy most players know this but what they usually mess up are all of these medium strength hands sixes sevens eights second pair third pair they're not finding the check raises with these weird mergy hands because it's difficult to play right it feels like you're playing like overplaying your hand but this is just the right counter to a range bet so let's see what happens if we force big blind to check raise a more polarized strategy and the way I'm going to accomplish this is by forcing these medium strength hands to check, I think that, or to call rather. I think that's a, a very natural strategy. I'm going to leave the rest of it unlocked so it can adjust its value and bluff thresholds in order to stay relatively balanced, but we're forcing it to play too polarized. All right, so here we raise, and you can see they're raising less often. That's one of the consequences of 
this super polarized range construction. It's not very efficient, so you don't get to raise as often. Okay, they raise, button calls, and let's take a flop, something like the ace of clubs. We already know that they're not calling ace high, so they can't represent top pair, but they can still represent trips plus, right? And they're still using a big size. The way you exploit this is often when they check. And the reason is that it's very, very difficult for them to defend their checking range. So here you can see that it's chosen a 42% size, but that's because that's the smallest size I gave it on the turn. So what happens if we give it, for example, a bunch of different sizes, 10, 25, 50, 75, 100, 150. So a whole bunch of different sizes here. Uh, now, if you recall earlier, I told you that you attack polarized ranges with small bets. And that's what we'll see here. The solver, when given the option, will prefer a very small bet size against this checking range. You can see it prefers this 10% pot size, just a wee little stab, right? And the reason is that their checking range is way too polar, right? They, they don't have very many natural like checking hands, right? So their checking range is like a few like super nutted traps and like at best king high, right? Mostly just trash. So when they check, they're too polarized, but we still have some incentive to fold out their bluffs. So we want to pick a size that is really hard for them to deal with, and that's 10% here. And again, these ranges that are too polarized are usually going to end up vulnerable against these really small sizes, min clicks, small bets and such. And you can see here that they have to fold 67% of their range to a 10% bet, which is just embarrassing. You don't want this to happen to you. So this is the main problem with ranges that are too polar. They're very hard to uh, play properly on later streets. This is another common example of like really common exploits you can find in game. So this is a button versus big blind spot and it's just been checked down all the way to the river. In this spot, button is supposed to find a nice thin value bet with hands like under pairs to the ace, 10x, etc. So what happens in game is people might take really polarizing sizings with and not find the thin value that's supposed to accompany that. So even though 71% is a fine sizing here, it can be difficult to find some of these thin value bets. So let's go ahead and just lock this in place. So what I'm going to do is set the strategy and just force these king 10, queen 10 type hands to check behind. We'll say that they still find the bluffs with the other hands, right? So we'll lock that all in place and we'll see what happens. So they put in this bet. It's too polar and they're under bluffing. And as you can see, uh, we just call super white. Anything that can even remotely be considered a bluff catcher is now a call. And the reason is simply that they're over bluffing. And even if we have, you know, we can see we only have like 34% equity, but that's enough against this size. It's, it's more than enough. So even though we're still losing with a lot of these bluff catchers because they're not bluffing enough, because they couldn't find those thin value bets, well, these now become reasonable calls. Next, I'd like to demonstrate the concept of leverage. I've chosen a queen-queen five flop, cutoff versus big blind. This is a pretty easy range bet for a small size. I don't think most players will mess that up, but let's run a little experiment in the name of science. I'm gonna give them this really awkward pot size bet. Two things to note about this, uh, well, three things. First of all, we're now checking a ton. Uh, because we're putting way too much money in. This is a very inefficient bet size because it donates too much to big blinds trips and overpays for the bluff to get them to fold nine high. So just not a great size for this type of board. Something to note here is that we're putting a bunch of these under pairs into this bot size bet. And again, this is to make them more merged, less polarized to decrease how exploitable you'll be against like min clicks and small bets on later straights. So basically we have some calling range for not just pure air and pure nuts. Let's run an experiment. If we bet pot, we're laying pot odds of 33%, right? Two to one. Now, if this were on a river, all that means is that we need to use two value bets to every bluff. So surely the same logic works in the flop, right? Let's create a perfectly polarized strategy. First of all, we'll make them check everything, lock that in place. Next up, we will make them always bet their trips, boats, and quads. Okay, so that accounts for 13% of their range here. Next, we're gonna make them bet all of these trash hands. And you can see this is 8%, 8.3% of the range. So overall, they are now bluffing a little more than a third of the time. And therefore, big blind should have about 33% equity versus this betting range. Let's see what happens. Put in this pot size bet, and they are just overfolding like mad here. And the reason is that bluff to value ratios in the river 
don't work the same way on turn and flop. If you go check out my leverage video, you'll see that they actually compound. The reason for that is because when cutoff bets and gets called, the hand isn't over. They can then bet turn and river, and they can keep repolarizing and attacking you again and again and again. So what actually needs to happen is you're not looking for 33% equity, you're looking to capture 33% of the expected value of the pot. And that's not going to happen against an opponent who's super polarized like this, because you're just not going to realize your equity with hands like 10s and 9s and 8s and such. And so this is the concept of polarity. Solvers will drastically overfold, especially on earlier straights versus very polarized ranges, even if those ranges are laying the quote-unquote correct pot odds simply because of leverage. Uh, and this is why if we go back to the GTO solution here, you'll find that it was actually bluffing quite a bit more than a third of the time. In fact, about two-thirds of the time it was bluffing with hands as weak as ace high, king high, and worse. So on the flop you need to be bluffing more than on later straights. The next fundamental imbalance is elasticity. This is probably the most dangerous one. Now, Elasticity is a term I borrowed from economics, which means how sensitive is their response to pricing? If they're highly elastic, then they're very sensitive to pricing. Whereas if they're inelastic, they are insensitive to pricing. So for example, an inelastic player may fold the same hands regardless of bet size, call these hand classes regardless of bet size, etc, etc. Now this is not one or the other, it's not binary, it's more of a scale, uh, where GTO would be the most elastic and most people, you know, human implementation wise are less elastic than GTO, novices being the least elastic. So I'm going to show you how to take advantage of a, an opponent that isn't elastic enough with their bet sizing. And I'll show you why this is such a dangerous exploit in the first place. For this next example, I've chosen a small blind versus cutoff three bet pot. As you can see, I've given it two sizes, 20% and 66, and it happily splits between both bet sizes. Now, what were to happen if we were to make cutoff's response less elastic versus this bet size? So what do I mean again by less elastic? Well, I mean that it's going to kind of fold and call and raise similar hand classes either way. So what we'll do to demonstrate this, first of all, I'm going to have them fold all of their trash. Then I'm going to have them call all of these weak hands, and they can adjust their best and good hands as they see fit. So now we're modeling a strategy that always folds this trash hands, always calls these kind of medium strength th showdown value hands. And we'll do the same thing against the larger bet size. So it's already folding all of this trash. So we'll just lock that in place and then we'll have it call these medium strength hands either way, fold these. So same strategy, they have to call medium strength hands, they have to fold trash hands and the top of the range is free to adjust as it pleases. What I'm saying here is that part of the range is relatively inelastic, right? A lot of these bet sizes uh, are now kind of locked in place. So if we take a look at how small blind has adjusted, we'll see that now they've just started range betting for this small size. And part of the reason for this, well, now they're overfolding versus this small size, obviously. So you can just go ahead and put a whole bunch of really weak trash in here. You'll see that we're not representing very strong hands with this size, right? Very few sets, two pairs, over pairs. Mostly we're representing just a bunch of nonsense just a bunch of like really weak hands and like medium strength stuff that is vulnerable and needs protection. Conversely, the large size is now getting a bit too much value, right? So what it's done as well is you'll see if we just filter for top pair plus, most of your top pair plus, especially your strong top pair and such, it's all going into the big size and less of it is going into the small size. In particular, if we just look at the nutted hands, they're almost exclusively going into the larger bet size. So it's just kind of playing face up really strong hands that want to get more value, go into the bigger size, and weaker hands that don't care as much, that just want some cheap fold equity, some protection, go into the smaller size. This is a really common exploit in practice, but it's also super dangerous because when you play your range super face up from the get-go like this, it's going to leave you vulnerable to exploits on later streets. So for example, if we call and we put in, let's say, like a seven or something here, you're going to see that now we basically just have to, to range check. I think this will be the case for the majority of turn cards where um, our range is just too weak at this point because we put all of our hands into this range and force cutoff to play tight. Now cutoff can attack us pretty aggressively. And so this is why elasticity is the most dangerous exploit because it's probably the most exploitable thing you can do in terms of how much risk it carries.
but it's also super valuable because, hey, I mean, if they're going to play super face up and not adjust to our sizing, then you might as well use that to your advantage. The final fundamental imbalance is board coverage. Board coverage is the study of how they distribute different hand classes throughout different lines. And the question we're interested in asking is, are certain lines over or undersaturated with those hand classes? A lot of novices, when they look at a GTO solution, they're confused as to why every hand class seems to be going into almost every line. And the reason is scarcity. So scarcity is this concept that if a hand is scarce within your range, it's underrepresented and therefore much harder to play against. So for example, a set is more deceptive than holding trips because it's easy to see trips on a board, but it's very hard to predict that your opponent will have a set. For example, on flush completing runouts, I gave this one earlier, I'll give it again, but imagine you're playing against an opponent that always bets their flush draws. Well, if the flush doesn't get there, you know they, they're probably overrepresenting bluffs. And if the flush does get there, you can simply overfold against that line because they're overrepresenting flush draws. So they'll get less implied odds with their flush draws because you won't pay them off when they get there. Now, imagine that, you know, they bet flop and then they check turn and the flush completes on the river. Well, in this case, you know that this type of player would have bet their flush draws, therefore they can't represent them in this checking line, and therefore you can run them over and attack aggressively. So there's lots of uh, types of exploits like this where the solver will mix different types of hands in order to remain unexploitable in different lines. In practice, humans don't do that. They tend to have very poor board coverage, which opens up exploitative ideas. Another common example is top-heavy three-betting ranges. So some players are very Broadway-focused with their three-bets, for example. You know, lots of king-jack, ace-10, queen-jack, etc. Well, three-bets should be somewhat top-heavy. If they're too top-heavy and they don't have enough of, for example, the suited connectors, the wheel aces, all of this stuff, they're going to be struggling on a lot of different types of boards. And so this is why a solver will tend to mix in a little bit of everything into these lines so that it can represent strong hands on a wide variety of runouts. Board coverage can be difficult to recognize in practice, but let me show you a few very common examples of how you can use this to your advantage. For this last example, I've chosen a slightly deep stack small blind versus cutoff, three bad pot, and this video is already getting too long, so I'm just going to do the flush draw example I alluded to earlier. Now, you'll notice I've switched into horizontal mode. Vertical mode looks like this. Horizontal mode shows each combination in the range individually, and that's gonna come in handy. What we're gonna do is we're gonna node log them to always barrel their flush draws. And we're gonna go through each street and just force them to barrel flush draws. So they do this, they call, and they can adjust the rest of their strategy as they see fit. We'll put a 10 on board, node log this. Same thing, always barreling the flush draws. Okay, they can still try and remain balanced with this. That's fine. And then we'll complete the flush at the end. And you can see all of a sudden it starts to check these flushes as a trap. You can see if we check here, we're supposed to be barreling with like a bunch of top pair and we also have some flushes, but let's imagine that again, they barrel these flushes on the river. And so we're still calling like a pretty decent amount here versus this bet. But note that small blind needs to find some like kind of absurd bluffs here. So for example, what happens if we just decrease the bluffs very slightly? Let's just make just these hands check. We haven't changed the strategy much. We're just decreasing their bluffs ever so slightly, right? So their whole range is locked, but now they're under bluffing. And now you can see we're folding way more. Obviously still calling with some flushes, but even start folding like some of the lower flushes here, which is a little surprising. But the point is that if your opponent is always putting flushes into certain lines, then it becomes pretty face up. And essentially what happens is they're losing implied odds because now they're not getting paid off by very many worse hands when they barrel or unless they're finding like a lot of ridiculous bluffs to go along with it. Uh, moreover, the other exploit is that, for example, let's say they check and let's say we check behind and we get an ace. Well, remember that they always barrel their flushes or their flush draws. Now that they don't have flush draws, we can play pretty aggressively, right? You can see 171% pot, 100% pot. We can be very, very aggressive on these flush completing runouts if they've checked because we've made the assumption that they're barreling their flush draws, right? And this is the same for any hand class. If any one particular line becomes too saturated with certain types of hand classes, especially when it comes to sebi bluffs, essentially, those hands will lose implied odds because it's more obvious that your range contains too many or not enough of this type of hand. 
I've heard players call this the concept of scarcity. Like I said earlier, hands that are not in your range very often, it's harder for your opponent to defend against those. But in this case, or in the last case, I should say, where they're putting all of their flushes into one line and onto other lines, it's the opposite, right? It's too saturated in one line. Now, this exists in other spots. So if their range is just Broadway hands, for example, it's pretty easy to play against this type of three betting range because you probably have them crushed on all of the middling and low boards. And you can just fold like crazy if the board comes like 10 queen ace, right? This is the concept of board coverage. And this is why solvers tend to mix different hand classes and try and ensure that they can represent value on many different types of runouts. Let's recap what we've learned. Today's lecture was all about the five fundamental imbalances, and this will give you a starting guide to learning exploitative poker. The first major imbalance is betting volume, which asks the question of what lines they're putting in more money. Those are the lines you want to redirect your nutted hands to. Keep in mind that GTO solutions are often built on the assumption that your nutted hands will make the same money in, for example, the betting in the checking line or the big bet in the small bet line, but in practice, typically one line is going to be far more profitable against the human opponent. Equity management asks the question of, first of all, how do they value their equity? Are they over or undervaluing certain hand classes? And how can we take advantage of that? And secondly, where are they putting their strongest hands? Are they putting a lot of their nutted hands into one line, but not the other line? Well, that's a crucial piece of information. Then we have polarity. And polarity asks about their general range construction. Are they too polar? Are they too condensed? Are they using some huge size representing nutted hands that they'd never have here? If so, maybe that's a bluffing imbalance. And we can attack this by modulating our bet sizing as well. Next, there is elasticity, which asks the question of how sensitive they are to pricing. Are they going to fold this or that hand kind of regardless of bet size? Are they going to call this or that hand class regardless of bet size? Well, that creates incentive for you to play your hand strength. And finally, there is board coverage, which asks if certain hand classes are over or underrepresented in their range. And this creates some clairvoyance and allows you to play against that range more easily. So you'll know when they've improved a lot and when they haven't improved at all. These five fundamental imbalances will guide your exploitative strategy and allow you to build more complex exploits going forward. All right, thanks for watching guys, that's my video. If you like this content and you got something out of it, if you found it valuable, please like and subscribe. That's the best thing you can do to help support us and help us bring more high level YouTube content for free. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below or join our Discord, link in the description. That's all for now, happy grinding.